Hello, this is Surima Proveyor. I am a filmmaker, photographer, and writer. And today I'll be moderating this Q&A session for the film, What Do You Believe Now? in this Interfaith Film and Music Festival. I am very honored to have with me part of the crew and the contributors of this film. And with me is Sara Feinblum, the director, producer of the film, Alex Realado, who was the editor slash producer. We have David Preston Thomas, Karina Liu, Morgan Green, and Anthony Valdez, who are part of the contributors of the documentary. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So let's going to start really quickly because I'm sure everyone is very anxious to know more about the story behind the documentary. And I would like to start with Sara and maybe Alice has something to, to say as well. And it's about the motivations and concerns that drove you to make this film and to follow up uh, with the characters 17 years later. Well, first, thank you so much for um, sharing our film and your wonderful film festival. We're really excited to be part of it. Um, uh, what motivated me to make this documentary? Well, I don't know, it's like 20 years ago, I had a particular motivation and then I had, uh, I was inspired to also make the follow-up, which is this combination of what you see in the film. Um, I think uh, my whole life, I've always been really interested in diversity of all kinds and um, feel like that is what makes America so great <laughs> and fascinating and um, rich um, and special. So I was always interested in all kinds of diversity, but I also used to teach high school and I often found that there weren't materials about religion that really connected with young people and that showed the richness of religion and spiritual, you know, beliefs, religious and spiritual beliefs. So kind of, a, I think a lot of it was for that. I mean, I specifically, I, I had one student who was the only Muslim in the whole class, actually, in, maybe in the whole school, and she suffered a lot. Um, so I kind of wanted to make something for students like that who were misunderstood and, um, so that's one of the reasons. I mean, there's many, many reasons, but I, I, um, I think that I sort of set out to do that. And I, and I initially um, did this in the Bay Area, which is a really cool, diverse place. And, and that's where I was lucky enough to meet the young people that are now in their 30s, who, you, who you're all gonna get to talk to today. So, yeah. so you just mentioned um, the contributors. Um, and that will be my second question. They all have very interesting stories, very interesting backgrounds. Uh, they all come from different religions or different beliefs. Um, so how difficult was to find them? How difficult was to find them, engage them, and then reconnect with them 17 years later? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I actually interviewed over 200 teenagers for the first film. <laughs> so it was kind of like this huge net I cast to try to meet the right ones. I met a lot of wonderful teenagers um, in the process, but I was looking for particular stories and particular relationships to one's faith. And um, I also wanted to be sure to include spiritual um, positions and, and that we don't usually hear about because we, you know, we hear a lot about Christianity in the United States and Christianity is a beautiful tradition. Um, but I, I felt like we weren't, in, in order to kind of understand our di diversity and the like I was saying, the richness of America, we, we really need to hear from more voices. So, I mean, I had some really crazy stories um, trying to find the six that I found. I, I went to mosques and I sort of, tried to tried to find a young woman who was who veiled and no one would talk to me and then I finally got got in touch with one mosque and they introduced me to a, a young man and I didn't want him to be in the film and then one day I was driving in San Francisco and I saw two young women walking who were wearing the hijab and I literally pulled my car over and 
jumped out and ran up to them and said, please, please, I'm looking for a young woman to be in my documentary. And I was very lucky because they invited me to their house. And then one of them turned out to be Mezuzah, who's in the, in the film. Um, Anthony, I met when I went to a Catholic boys school. There was, I interviewed like 30 kids and I was about to leave. I was packing up my equipment and he peeked his head into the into the room and said, hey, I heard you're interviewing people. And he sat down and he was just so beautiful that I just couldn't resist. And so I said, okay, let's talk. Um, Karina, I met a long time before I even really started the film and she wanted to do it. And then she didn't want to do it. And I went to so many different Buddhist temples. And then finally I went to one and I saw this incredible young woman there and it it was kind of like, it was magic because it turned out it was her. And I found her like two years later. Um, I think Morgan, I found through Craigslist or something. I mean, it was just, you know, when you're trying to find, when you're a filmmaker and you're trying to find people, it's sort of like you, you have to kind of follow the trail and you have to be really brave and, and sort of take a lot of risks. And then you hope you, you can connect with people that are, willing to tell their story so yeah and then and David I someone else I was supposed to meet another young Jewish um, teenager and I went to his synagogue and um, the the head of the synagogue saw me and she said what are you doing here I didn't even give you permission and then she said but if you're gonna be here you really should interview this young kid, this young teenager and he sat down so it was just all these kind of wonderful and uh, you know, detours and obstacles, but in the end, I, I was really privileged to meet all six of them. Um, so what motivated me to make the follow-up? You know, I never thought I would ever make a follow-up. It was so much work to make this film. And you can imagine 200 young people and, and just, it was really my first film that I made in 2002. But people would ask me over the years and then, you know, what happened to them, what happened to them. And then, you know, Facebook happened and the internet happened. And I actually started hearing from a couple of them. And one of them is Julius Not Afraid, who's the Lakota young man. And he, he basically said, I, I really want you to come and do a follow-up. And, it, you know, when, when you have that great responsibility and that great honor that someone's asking you to do that. And he said, look, there's, things I wanna talk about and I wanna share. It's kind of like you have to rise to the occasion. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't wanna to try to raise money. I don't wanna to try to do all this again. But anyway, so I went and then I, and then I reached out to the others and kind of <laughs> twisted their arms uh, to do it again. But they can tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, I think hearing from them will be a very nice comp um, compliment to your your story. So this one will go for for the contributors. And um, basically, you open up when you were a teenager, you, you share your uh, views about the religion you somehow inherited from your parents or you were brought up into. And then 17 years later, with a lot of life experiences on your side, Sara comes back with her camera. And of course, your views have changed. Your life has put you through um, a lot of tests that might have, you know, either strengthened or like, um, um, you know, make you evaluate your faith. So I would like to know from you guys how difficult it was to confront the belief you have when you were teenagers with the ones you have now through the documentary. And if the film helped you have a new approach, a new perspective to your faith. Morgan, would you like to start? Sure. Yes, I'll start. So I, I'm thinking now about how the first film, there were several years between when we started shooting and then when the film premiered. And it actually was a lot harder for me as an older teenager at the premiere watching my younger teenage self than it was when I was older and I was watching the, the first film in preparation for being interviewed for the the second film. And I remember as that older teenager at the premiere being really embarrassed by the simplicity of my beliefs and how confidently I expressed them in the film. 
And I was really expecting to have all of that embarrassment come up again when Sarah tracked us down and she sent me a link to the film. But instead what I found is I, I just felt kind of this deep sense of compassion for my younger self. And I didn't find myself really scrutinizing my own words. And I felt curious about how I have changed and how I'm continuing to change. And I felt curious about how all people change over time and how fluid beliefs are. And that kind of awakened a motivation to be as authentic and forthcoming about my beliefs during the shooting of the second film so that that could be documented. Good. Anthony, you, you, you had a very interesting story. Would you like to share, like how was, you know, to, to tell it in the documentary? Yeah, uh, so Sarah, I think it was about three years after my coming out as gay that the filming happened. And I really hadn't taken the time to, to do a deep dive into how I felt about Christianity and, and Catholicism. Um, you know, it's clear that the Catholic Church doesn't accept uh, homosexuality. And, you know, I kind of accepted that, you know, and I've been back to church for funerals and, uh, you know, first communions for my niece and nephews, um, but really kind of put it aside and, and said, you know, it's, it's not going to be a very active part of my life. Um, and, you know, it, it did take Sarah some convincing to, to kind of have me join the film the second time um, because I, I felt a responsibility to, to represent, you know, Christians that, that struggle with their, their homosexuality. Um, and I both when I finally decided to, to do it again, I kind of uh, just let go of that and just decided to, to just tell my story. Um, but it, it ended up being a wonderful experience because it did um, give me the opportunity to, to take some time to think about, you know, where I fall, which is, you know, still as a Christian um, and, and my, and kind of just rediscover my identity um, and where it fits in. Karina, David, would you like to share some of your thoughts? Uh, if not, it's fine, you just want to be participating. Um, I can, I can share. Oh, go ahead, David, you can go first. Um, so going back, uh, when I was a teenager, I think making the film really made me answer a lot of questions that I had never thought about before um, and really kind of discovered what I believed like along the way. <laughs> um, so looking back on it, it's very fun and very interesting to see. Um, and in retrospect, I see how connected I was to my the Jewish community that I was raised in um, and that I stayed a part of through well after college, uh, the entire time I was still in the Bay Area. Um, and now that I've been in New York for about new year, uh, nine years and don't really, you know, don't have that same connection. Um, and so that's really what I've thought about a lot more um, is, you know, sort of missing that community. Um, but at the same time, I mean, obviously my, my faith is, <laughs> was kind of lacking to begin with, but um, you know, there's, there's still a piece that, that you're missing. Thank you, David. Karina? Yes, hi. Um, it's funny to hear everyone's responses first because I feel like there are pieces from everyone's reactions that I can completely relate to. Um, and I think especially um, with what, um, David just shared about not being connected to his community as much um, and then sort of um, noticing how connected he was as a teenager. That was definitely how I felt. Um, I feel like the film offers a time capsule um, to what it was like to be a teenager. And I'm hoping that, you know, years from now, we'll look back at the second um version of the film and feel the same way that like okay how much have we changed since then and I think that that's one of the great things about having um been part been a participant of this film is being able to see how much I've evolved and maybe I might become a lot more like I was when I was younger um after having lived so much of my adult experience um and 
you know, seen things in different ways and, and tried on different things. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm glad to hear that the film brought to you some sort of like closure or like, you know, reconciliation with your, with your faith. And, and um, the spine of this film are your interviews, are your, your testimonies. And that's the next thing I would like you to talk about, Sara. And I would like to bring on Alex, uh, who was the editor. So I would like to hear about your interviewing techniques. If you have any, you know, I would say rituals around it to engage your uh, contributors. And then Alex, how to articulate this in the, in the editing and how to make sense of it and how to connect one testimony to the other and, and still like, two different religions, two different experiences, and still one film. Yeah. Well, I think that, first of all, I just loved hearing all of them, all of you guys. You're so great. I just love, I just love you all. So thank you for joining this, um, this film festival with us. It's really great. Um, so, you know, I never went to film school. So I didn't really know how to interview in any kind of formal way. Um, and maybe that was to my advantage. I mean, I, it, I also think I tortured them when they were teenagers because I asked them so many questions over and over again. Um, and I was a little bit like sort of awkward and, and maybe clumsy at times, um, but maybe that made it easy. I don't know, they'll have to tell me how they felt. <laughs> But I think that um, I, you know, I love I I love young people. I think they're they're truth tellers, and they um, are they have great wisdom. But we don't ask them what they think, and so I'm always interested in. I you know I like to talk to old people and people my own age and younger people. But I think that um, I I hope I've gotten better as an interviewer. I mean, I think that. Um, you know, I probably interrupted a lot more when I was younger. I think you, one of the, the best ways to be an interviewer is to hold space, is to create space for someone to tell their story and to not be sort of thinking what's their next question, but to really listen to what they're saying. Um, because from there, it's just, there's, there's so much to kind of unpack and unfold. And, um, so yeah, so I think that, I mean, maybe, maybe that's sort of my, my, um, my sort of little, um, you know, tip for other documentarians is, is, is maybe to just kind of be quiet and, and be okay with some of the silence. And I don't always do that, but if you do, you just, you, you create more room and more space for that person. And I don't really, I don't really, I'm not really interested in myself. I'm really interested in them. So I think that sort of like, you know, just want, allowing them to lead it a little bit. And I think that as they got older um, and they were, they'd already been through it once that the next time that we met, they were, they kind of knew what to do and they kind of, and they were comfortable with me. And I think they could take more of a co-creator role. And they were like, you know, I want you to show me, um, you know, teaching in my classroom. And, you know, and I want you to show me with my friends at my graduation or all the things that they opened up, um, that, the, that you guys opened up. So that's also really um, a special um, experience is to kind of co-create what we're, what the film is about and me just kind of, help them tell, help you guys tell your stories. And I, listening to all of you, and I just listened to Karina, I'm like, okay, we, we probably have to do a follow-up in 10 years because that would just be so cool. And, and if you're all up for it, I mean, that would be really cool. So anyway. And then Alex, you can talk about how crazy it was with all that footage. Are you on, Alex? Yeah, I am. You know, it was crazy editing this. It was just a lot of material, but really, I mean, we had probably about an hour or maybe two of an interview with their current adult selves. So we really knew who they were and who what their beliefs were now. So really what took the longest was going back into the archives of all the questions that Sarah had answered and trying to find kind of an arc for them. 
that maybe they didn't even know they had in their stories. So it was really just kind of, okay, what is Morgan's arc? Like, what was she feeling then and now and how do they relate? And, you know, what does that say about her belief? And then once we kind of captured the essence of everybody, then the even bigger challenge was, okay, well now how do we marry them all together? Because if we put David and Anthony next to each other who have a lot of similarities, it kind of, we're saying one thing, but if we mix it in a different way, we're actually saying something completely different. So we went through lots of different edits. I have everything on like little index cards and it was like a crazy map of like, let's try this, let's try that. And uh, yeah, but we were happy with it in the end, I think we were happy with it. You had a great film, so you should be very <laughs> So very briefly, Sara, because before closing, I would like to hear the opinions of the contributors again on, on faith and tolerance these days. But before that, I know you have a letter career as a distributor. And um, that's something very paramount these days because you can make a beautiful film, but if no one watches, uh, sometimes it defeats the purpose. So I would like to hear a little bit about how this experience as a distributor has influence your storytelling and a little bit about how was to distribute what do you believe and what do you believe now afterwards? Oh, okay, thanks, sure. Um, so my company is called Good Docs and we focus on social justice and human rights documentaries. Um, and I come to this work as an educator. So when I think about making films, I think about the audience and I think filmmakers should think about that. Who's watching it and how are they gonna use it? Um, and how can it be useful to, to communities and students and teachers? So, I mean, I, I, that's just always kind of, I'm always thinking about who, who's gonna see this. Um, and I made the first film for young people. And I guess this next film, the, the one now that you played at the festival is for millennials um, because it's about you guys and your generation. Um, so yeah, so um, you were asking sort of for, for other, for filmmakers, I mean, there's a lot to talk about distribution and I'd be happy to, you know, people can reach out to me. Um, I really focus on educational distribution, which is different than theatrical or, or television, but um, you can check out Good Docs. But I, I want to hear from, I want to hear you guys talk about the next question. <laughs> sure. So for the interest, uh, for the people interested in the audience, Good Dogs is Sada's company. You can reach out to her if you want to know more about her work and her work as a uh, distributor as well. Sorry. So guys, to close down very quickly, we've, uh, the world has been undergoing a very deep crisis last month, and I believe a spirituality of all kinds to have assisted people and supported them during these difficult times. So I want to hear your experience, like how your faith helped you or not during these times. And I would like to hear a little bit of a message of tolerance uh, among all of us, no matter race, no matter religion, no matter where we're coming from. Can I answer first? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, I think we definitely have gone through a really interesting time. I think uh, particularly uh, being Asian American, right? And with this last pandemic, um, the Asian American community, the Chinese community especially experienced a lot of xenophobia because of the way that um, the framing of the coronavirus was initially brought forward to the American public. And um, I, I definitely feel like that hurt the community a great deal. Um, to feel like there's um, sort of this yellow peril, um, ye yellow peril kind of ideology propaganda being put, pushed forth, and that there was a lot of violence against the, uh, the Asian community, especially against Asian women. Um, and so it definitely did light the fire amongst many people to feel like, one, we need to have more solidarity with people who are at the forefront of Black Lives Matter, of um, wanting to be more conscientious of um, how um, we as a community engage with social justice and um, whether or not our narratives are being told in, in the ways that um, actually help foster more unity and more awareness of diversity and inclusion and belonging. So um, first and foremost, I think that was really important. And I think for me that actually um, during that time um, actually became a lot more involved with um, spiritual community with other API women. And we were actually meditating together 
Um, and the meditation sessions were so powerful and we were really, really, um, we were really connected with each other during that time. I think out of that need to really recognize that we need to heal from a certain degree of trauma and a certain degree of being silenced as a demographic, and then also needing to find solidarity with other people who have experienced the same things, but want to grow in the same way. So not to reproduce trauma, but to really deal with what's hurt within, within us and then use our meditation, use our spirituality, use our traditions um, to help us find a way forward. Um, so it's actually been um, an interesting time, really, really um, an opportune time, I think, to go back to the roots, to go back to our practices, um, to build community and to ask ourselves reflective questions again. Thank Great experience, Serena. Everyone else from the contributors want to share their experience very quickly before we close the conference. I would like to hear some of you guys. Morgan, David, um, any of you? Or Sara, maybe you wanna say something about your own spirituality and how it helped you, maybe your work, maybe your religion is filmmaking. Um, Do you guys, go ahead, go ahead. Thank I'm you, Karina, for sharing that, yeah. I, I, I'm inspired by what Karina said um, to say that I think this is a really interesting time to reflect on unity and what unity means. And I don't really think that religious tolerance is the key to unity. I believe that the key is divesting from faith as a means of power and control and recognizing that religion can systematically enforce white supremacy and colonialism and sexism and heterosexism and homophobia and the gender binary and it just keeps going on and on. And when we talk about religious intolerance, really we're talking about hatred and subjugation and murder. And I think really in order for us to respect each other's spiritual paths, part of our own spiritual path has to be recognizing the role of faith in our lives and how it intersects with power. And I know that that can be really, really tricky because most of us don't have a great sense of power in our lives as it is. Um, and that can be scary work. Thank you, Morgan. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. We plan this uh, to, to keep the audience enticed and to share your experiences after the film. I wanna thank everyone for being here. Your stories are amazing. Your film is amazing. And I invite everyone to watch the film if you haven't and to go to Good Docs, which is Sada's company, and know more about these beautiful people in this beautiful Thank you. And, and invite us to come speak. At, we really want to be able to speak around the country. And I think you can tell th these young people are just extraordinary. And they've got a lot to say. And, I, and, and there's a couple more of us. And we'd really like to 